Uh, our second speaker today is Dr. Nohidaya Mohamed Taufek from Institute of Biological Sciences, uh, ISB at University of Malaya. And she's a senior lecturer and obtained her PhD also from University of Malaya with specialization in aquaculture nutrition research. She also has experience in fish reproduction endocrinology and aquaculture feed technology. Her current research interests include development of sustainable solutions for animal feed, including aquatic animals and poultry, using local renewable resources such as insect meal and mushroom byproducts. Dr. Nohida is also actively working with industry to promote the use of black soldier fly as protein source to produce cost effective and halal feed, as well as for the implementation of circular bioeconomic purposes. Today, she's going to share with us her thoughts on sustainable feed for aquaculture, past, present, and future trends. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Nohidaya. So thank you, Prof. Jenny, for, uh, for your, the brief in, uh, information about me. And, uh, and also thank you to Seba for inviting me as a speaker today. So um, I'm Hidaya from Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science and uh, I'm an aquaculture nutritionist. So for that reason, I'm going to present my presentation for today, which entitled Sustainable Fit for Aquaculture, Past, Present and Future Trends. Right, so when we talk about aquaculture, we cannot run from the sustainability issues. And any products from aquaculture must take into consideration about the sustainability factors. Even when producing aquaculture feed, or uh, we call it aqua, aqua feed now, the sustainability impact of the products uh, and the processing, all of that must consider uh, the sustainability impact before it goes into manufacturing. So I know this um, sustainability term is, is quite overhyped, but uh, please bear with me. So we need to look at a broader perspective when talking about sustainability. So the outcome of the products that we, uh, we want to produce in this matter, the aquafit, it should be in a sweet spot in between the, the, the social, the economic and the environmental evaluations. So as according to the uh, SDGs goals as well. And the topics of sustainability is actually closely related to solving malnutrition. So with aquaculture nutrition, we can find a way to improve this issue as shown in, in Bangladesh, in countries like Bangladesh, for example, where we teach women to farm fish, it's not only helping them to boost the economy, but also producing high quality protein for their consumption. So at the end of my presentation, I will share why this matters. So fish nutrition, how it started. So when trying to learn about the current issue uh, and, and anticipate about the future, we need to look at the history of the given topics. So uh, in this case, in 1924, Embody and Gordon tried to produce feed for trout, which is a fish species, salmonid species, by looking at the fish gut's content. So at this time, these two researchers already know the importance of protein, lipid, carbohydrates, and, and vitamins for this fish. So even back then, they already know that there's a lot of things need to be uncovered for, for this particular species. So up until um, 1950s, there's no term of fish nutrition until uh, the emerge of John Harvard. So John Harvard is considered as the father of fish nutrition. And uh, he is considered as the man who initiates the fish nutrition uh, studies in Washington. And his thesis, uh, his thesis is looking at uh, developing diet for Chinook salmon which composed of different uh, vitamins. And uh, this led him to studying the, the Chinook salmon nutrition requirement and other fish uh, throughout his life. So, and he was acknowledged as uh, 
the first person who formulated this diet called uh, H440, which defined as H for his name Halver, and 440 is the 440th attempt for him to get this successful, successful recipe for this diet. Right. So um, due to John Harvest's research and uh, other nutritionists after him, we have seen a tremendous uh, growth of aquaculture industry. And we cannot deny this growth is because of the, the high quality fit and the nutrition study that, that's been around for the past 50 years. And of course, other factors like vaccines and the improved strains of the species and of, and of course the government's policies also plays major roles in this development. So historically, um, studies on fish nutrition actually only revolve around salmonid species, salmon species. But for the past 30 years, uh, there are more and uh, more studies on Asian or tropical fish available and conducted by the researchers around the world. And we have seen a tremendous growth in terms of uh, research on formulated feed for animals, for aquatic animals. So of course, if, you, if you're going to produce a high quality uh, in, in high density control environment, we need to uh, supply the animal with formulated feed produced sustainably. And in order to produce the feed for animal, we cannot disconnect the nutritive value of the materials used to make the feed and the nutritional requirement of the animals. So as a nutritionist, we need to understand the species requirement. And we also need to understand the practical nutrition resources. So uh, we, we need to have a balance of understanding between the animals and the ingredients we use. So um, as a nutritionist, we also need to know how to culture the ingredients, uh, how to optimize the nutritional value of that particular in ingredients, besides knowing the, the fish feeding behavior, the, their life cycles and the environment that they live in. And due to the high demand of seafood products today, uh, we have seen uh, an increasing trend of aquaculture activity for the past uh, 30 to 40 years. And we can also see a plateau trend of capture fisheries, as mentioned by Dr. IDB just now, because of the overfishing practice. So now the current situation is capture fisheries are constantly monitored. So the amount of wild stock fish that we take out from the ocean is, is monitored. So that is why um, fish meal, which is one of the main protein source in animal and inclu including aqua feed, um, has been currently be being very much advocated to be replaced with alternative feed ingredients because of the unsustainable practice of producing this. So fish meal basically is the, the best uh, protein sources for fish. So fish eating fish is the best condition for, for fish production. So replacing fish meal uh, is not only replace the protein sources, but fish meal contain uh, many other nutritional profiles like lipids, phospholipids, minerals. All these are, are uh, essential for the, for the animal, for the fish itself and very pal palatable to the animals. So what more? Um, Fish meal doesn't have anti-nutritional factors, which is very common in, in plant ingredients uh, it, that we use in fish, fish feed, uh, for example, soybean. So um, to produce a sustainable feed, we need to we need alternative feed ingredients to replace this traditional fish meal and uh, imported corn and soybean that we use now in, in our local feed manufacturing. So we have been um, overfishing for the past 30 years and uh, a lot of deforestation, deforestation have, have been happening for just for, for planting crops just to feed animals. So some of the crops that we use in animal feed like soybean and corn are, are imported and they utilize a huge amount of land and water and 
these crops are only uh, fit for animal and we can use this crop as as uh, for directly for human consumption. So therefore, we need resources that is highly available, uh, economical and uh, non-human food and high in quality uh, as a alternative feed ingredients to replace these traditional ingredients. And currently, there are four types of ingredients uh, available that we use in feed. So uh, the first one is plant protein. Uh, plant protein, which include the all seeds, cereal, uh, pulses, and this includes aquatic, aquatic plants as well. And we also have vertebrates proteins from a uh, slaughterhouse, basically uh, poultry byproducts, feather meal, blood meal. Um, we also currently have been tested testing single single cell protein. Uh, typically from fungi, yeast, algae, and bacteria, and also invertebrates proteins from insects, polycytes, and crustaceans. So due to this reason, as part of my research, I've been working with um, insects in animal sources of protein. So insects have been used in my lab to produce protein source for, for um, animals, uh, for fish. Uh, right now, we have been working with two species of insects, uh, crickets and black soldier fly. Um, crickets, when I'm doing my PhD, and black soldier fly is the current interest now. And uh, so far, actually, insects have been used as food in, in many countries. Okay? Um, many cultures have been using insects as food. But in Malaysia, it is not our norm to use insects as food but it can be used as animal feed. So far, several types of uh, insects species, including mealworm, black soldier fly, house fly, crickets have been tested as animal feed. And their nutritional profile is, is uh, comparable to fish meal and soybean. If you can see from the table here, uh, from the graph here, sorry, um, the insects that have been defatted, uh, for example, uh, mealworm and black soldier fly has comparable protein sources. It's, it's around 70% protein sources um, and it's quite similar to fish meal and even higher than soybean meal. So this shows that we can optimize the processing method to improve the nutritional profile of the ingredients. And when choosing any ingredients, it's not it's not only about the nutritional profile of that ingredients. We also need to monitor other aspects like the biological active compounds. So insects have been um, observed to contain these three uh, biological compounds, chitin, antimicrobial peptides, and lauric acids, like crickets here, uh, which have been observed to contain chitin, which is a very useful immunostimulant that could boost immune response of catfish. And other than chitin, um, we, black soldier fly also contains uh, antimicrobial peptides or AMPs, which is a compound that can active, effectively protect fish against infectious disease. And uh, AMPs is considered as defense uh, weapons uh, and has been labeled as harmless alternative to antibiotics. And on the other hand, insects oil is also beneficial on immune response of fish. Uh, current paper published from our lab have found a very high concentration of lauric acid in BSF oil. And so far, not very much, uh, not very, not a lot of pub publication available on, on lauric acid as, as, uh, to, uh, as anti antibiotics or to, but actually lauric acid has exhibit a strong antimicrobial activity and Lauric acid is the main source of coconut and palm oil, and now it can be found in black soldier fly. And besides knowing the nutritional properties of the insect's protein, um, as the animal nutritionist, we also need to know how to optimize the growth, their growth, and harvesting them, how to process them. And these uh, techniques actually will influence their nutritional characteristics. And so far, there are over 244 
over 200 species, uh, fat species, I mean, uh, which include fish and crustacean species, commercially cultured around the world. But uh, up to now, only less than 30 species are widely studied. These, these species only, um, some, some species like salmonids and carps are widely available, but there are still a lot of understudied species, including our local species. And um, most of our, uh, most of the producers, aquaculture producers uh, in Malaysia, they need to import the feed ingredients. So that is the reason why our feed is still fairly expensive. And uh, this will affect our, our own farmers, which then influence the market price for um, the aqua aquatic animal species. So the options now is, is to use a local feed ingredients available. This is a key to mitigate these issues. Therefore, um, Having in-house R&D to produce local feed uh, manufacturing is essential because R&D today is for tomorrow. And this practice, this in-house R&D is already common in Europe, but still lacking in, in major part of the world. So that is why we still um, has very limited information, particularly on our local species. And we need to educate our farmers to use local feed ingredients and to minimize waste and not just relying on, on uh, R&D's outcome from others, other countries, which might not be different, might, might not be suitable for us. And talking about R&D, again, um, we need to uh, use innovative techniques like fermentation and biotech application and to improve the nutritional value of, of our local feed ingredients. And uh, this could enhance the quality of our feed. And uh, in Malaysia, we are still using a lot of natural public water as a medium of aquaculture. So we need to be res responsible. Uh, and uh, as a nutritionist, we also need to produce highly digestible feed to uh, minimize waste product flowing into this water, this, this uh, natural water bodies. And this need commitment from both uh, farmers and also feed producers. And we also need to recognize the alternative feed sources available today, like insects meal. Um, like it or not, human population is increasing. And as human, we are still meat eater or at least seafood eater. And this farm animal need to be supplied with feed that is not uh, made for human consumption. So by minimizing the use of human food as animal ingredients, we could have a sustainable feed. And um, last but not least, another far-fetched out of the world idea is probably to push our boundaries, to explore the unknown. So in this case, can we ask Mr. Elon Musk, can we culture fish on Mars? Right, so coming towards the end of my presentation, I'm sharing here a picture of a very humble or insignificant uh, of fish pellets. So probably you might be wondering, almost anybody can, can create this. But to achieve to this stage, it needs, uh, we need to connect multiple industries, milling industries, uh, reduction fisheries, rendering, all seed processing. So all these industries come together in order to produce this feed. And it is a very important and complicated process to meet the specific requirement for our species of interest. Even though this pallet here, the image of this pallet, pallet here doesn't look like much. And at the end of the day, for me, it's all about finding solution to reduce malnutrition problem. And um, malnutrition is still uh, kill a lot of people uh, compared to genocides or AIDS. And nearly 2 billion people still earn less than $3 per day. And we have two, two types of consumers. So one side of consumer, uh, they don't have enough money. So it's always problem about the price and products that they can afford. And the other sides of the consumers, um, they always concerned about sustainability, um, overnutrition, and also environmental impact. 
So how to satisfy both both consumers? So for me as a as a nutritionist, we need to find a, a right balance in solving the, the problems like malnutrition here without killing uh, the earth that we live in. So that's all for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hidayah. Another very nice uh, presentation and, and lots of things for us to think about. Um, and it looks like this is um, a very important topic. Uh, I think especially in Malaysia because uh, we are very fond of our fish and seafood. So um, I'm opening the floor for questions. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question or you can just take a chance and turn on your mic and shout out because I, I think there's still quite a lot of people in the room, so uh, it's difficult for me to, to see. Uh, maybe while we're waiting, um, Nohidaya, you, you said there's a lot of different things needed to, to get this feed industry um, changed and going. Uh, where, where would you start? What, what do you think um, can be done first to, to try to get maybe new, new feed producers in Malaysia using these uh, other alternative proteins like insect protein? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Jenny. Um, for me, actually, based on my experience and uh, what I've gathered so far and working with the industries, the main important things is um, education to the farmers. So we need to um, let them understand. We need to um, let them understand that in order for them to produce a high-quality animal with uh, economics, you know, uh, economical price, um, we need to use local ingredients. So we have been relying on imported feed for so long, and this has impacted the, the, the price. So we, uh, during uh, last, last month, I think, we have um, issues on, on a high price of chicken. So that's because of the imported feed, because of the feed feed prices already uh, increased a lot during this, this pandemic. Uh, this, during this COVID. So um, that's why uh, using, having our own R&D, using our own local feed and in, in Malaysia, we could uh, try to minimize the, the impact of this price. And yeah, I think that could be uh, the first thing that we have to do uh, as a researcher, I think to yeah, educate the, the farmers and the, the communities and the societies about why uh, alternative feed ingredients is important. Thank you. Hope that uh, answer. We have a question in the chat box. I don't know, Shavan, do you want to turn on your mic and ask? Shavan, are you there? Oh, sorry. Okay, so Shavan asks us to uh, look at the question. I, I will read it out. Um, says good day uh, on creating a feed for the aquaculture industry using insects what would your opinion be on bivalve culture uh, i'm not sure if this you're i guess you're asking as feed for bivalves or is it as using bivalves as the feed i'm not i'm not sure maybe dr nohadaya will have a better idea <laughs> okay um yeah so far uh, feed feed ingredients um, using animal insects insects based protein is mostly used for for uh, fish crustaceans there are still lack, lack of studies on bivalve culture because um, bivalve is not a fat species we don't we, we don't uh, supply feed pellet to bivalve uh, yeah they are filter feeders so uh, I don't. I'm not sure if insects is a is a alternative for by by valve culture at the moment. Uh, but crustaceans, uh, shrimp, yeah, we can use we can use insects based, and there's a lot of various studies available on insects as as crustaceans and fish species. But uh, so far, not. Uh, I I haven't seen in by valve. So yeah, that's okay. my answer. Thanks, uh, and, and Shavan thanks you for the answer. Uh, any more questions? Hello, uh, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I'm Dr. Shamsul from ISB, Bayou Kesehatan. 
program center kesihatan. So, okay, my question is because it's, uh, okay, in Fit is very new to me. Just so my question is, are the protein in the insects are essential for human consumption? Does it have the same protein like eating meat, like you have alginine, leucine, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, this is very new to me about insects protein. Uh, is it, are uh, their proteins essential for human consumption if you're thinking of uh, uh as as uh astronaut astronaut fit in the space program and such uh is it essential for an adult probably it's just to maintain but for growing up children they need lots of, lots of essential protein for for building up new bones building up more muscles strengthen the muscles and everything so okay <laughs> i'm sorry because I, I i haven't read any insects journals of their, their protein content so i like to know more thank you Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sam. Um, actually, insects have been used for a long, long time by uh, in a lot of cultures in South America and even in, in Southeast Asia, in Thailand. Um, they have been, they have consumed insects uh, for so long. But um, for, yeah, even in Sarawak. But um, for the... Uh, majority of of uh, us human population we we it's not our norm to con to to consume insects and in terms of uh, nutrition profile for for human consumption um, i think there's still lack of studies because uh, we we don't have a lot of data in terms of people who consume insects is it is it sufficient for the human nutrition yeah, but basically people just consume it just for the sake of uh, protein uh, to for uh, energy because uh, insects have high protein content. And yeah, so that's why they consume it. But uh, on the other hand, um, for me as a nutritionist, animal nutritionist, we can use these insects to feed, to feed animals because um, it's not... A typical human food so this is considered as an alternative food and they can be they can be uh cultured in a very limited space with limited water energy and so on so it's a very sustainable uh, source so yeah so in terms of nutritional profile for animal yes it is it is good already it, it has uh, positive growth and 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 all the health health status has been uh tested so it's good but for human i think it's we we still have lack information in terms of the nutritional profile and everything thanks i i just want to mention um dr hidayah there's there's a question whether you're able to share your slides or maybe you want to share yeah. a version of your slides um if if you can um uh if if you want to send that to seba we can share it to people who who have an interest in having the slides but okay so i will share yeah i will share with seba later the slides okay so anyone who wants a copy of dr hidayah slides please just send us an email and we can forward that to you later um so uh, we're going to continue with the question since there's still some interest. I know that some people may may want to leave, so I'll just say thank you for, very much for everyone who's here, still here, and uh, please do fill in the survey for us. Uh, we can continue with the questions if there are more questions. I can't see. Yes, any. I have a question. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Fikri, please go ahead. But yeah, but um, forgive me uh, if it's um, patchy because the internet connection suddenly like um, uh, because I think we lost you, Dr. Fikri. Uh, maybe you could try typing the question. Okay, he says he will type. <laughs> uh, he died. You can see the chat box. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see the chat box. Yeah. So, why Fikri is asking? Maybe I would like to say something, Jenny. 
Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi, hi. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, both from Adibi and Hidaya. Very, very good talk. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, as you were saying that the farmers in Malaysia uh, are very reluctant to change their feed preferences. Why is that so, uh, Hidaya? The feed, pre- the preference uh, of the feed. Yeah. Yeah. Prof. Yes, yes. Why is that uh, so? Did you ask them? It's not. It's not that they are reluctant to to change, but yeah. the availability of feed that we have right now is still a lot of it are uh, from from uh, imported feed. So, if we so that, are if so, so that goes to the question where Jenny was asking, why is uh, why is there no interest by the local businessmen to produce our own feed? Did you did you? Yeah. Uh, did you uh, ask this uh, business or industries why is there no so far in Malaysia people are not in, interested to invest in producing their own feed? I'm, I'm very curious, Idaya. Yeah. I know that I, I I know this problem has been so many years. Why why until now there's no interest? Do Do you know? Uh. I I I'm still not sure about why they don't uh they don't want but so far I've getting a lot of uh interest by by the industry already uh they are trying to to have their own local manufacturing feed all right now the Good. now the 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 trend is already there so we need to keep the momentum just and we need to educate them why why we oh, need to change good. yeah Hope, hope the, I, I, the have a, change. I have an, a, a little insight into that from um, a, a personal <laughs> case I know where uh, in, in case of poultry farmer who has actually started doing his own uh, black soldier fly production for his own poultry farm. So it's kind of like he's got the whole chain there. So it could be that that is one model if, if, um, if the technology can be introduced to the uh, aquaculture farmers for them to produce the feed themselves. Um, I guess you probably have to be quite a large scale operation to consider that, but that that certainly has been uh, practiced in the poultry industry. Uh, we I now have the question from Dr. Fikri uh, in the chat box there. So he's asking in terms of using insect as aquafeed, how sustainable is using the insect as opposed to using the plant source? So I guess what he means is you're feeding the insects probably on some plant materials. Uh, can is it um, as favorable to use the insects as to directly use the plant materials? And what are your thoughts in combining insects and plant materials? Um, yeah. So um, in terms of using insects as aquafit. Uh, as opposed to using local plant source, um, I think. The the question is the yield and and also the price. So the insects is we can culture insects uh, in a very limited space, and the the protein the protein sources uh, is actually quite high compared to the plant sources. So that's why we uh, currently opt for plant uh, so for insects uh, aqua feed, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't say that we cannot use plant sources. Yes, we 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 still have to use plant sources. So far, it's hard to just replace plant plant sources in aquafit altogether. In fact, it's hard to replace fish meal uh, altogether with insects meal. We still need uh, some uh, supply of plant sources. But what we can do is we can reduce reduce the amount in in the formulations. And um, combining insects and plant material as aquafit is also um, what I'm trying to do right now. So we have um, certain plant ingredients that we use. We can use as a as a fit steam, uh, fit additive in aquafit uh, as a supplement. And those are the things we can we can uh, we can incorporate plant plant sources in aquafit. So um, yeah, and also. Plant, plant materials because of the presence of anti-nutritional factors. So these anti-nutritional factors is the limitation in, in uh, 
for plant sources. So we need to eliminate these parts first before we can you can use it as as aquafit. And these problems uh, is not uh, we we don't have this kind of problem in insects feed so far. Um, yeah. So I think that's my thoughts on that. Thank you, uh, and uh, Dr. Fikri, thanks you. <laughs> Um, I'm yeah, just welcome. wondering for for, uh, for fish in in the wild. I guess do they they have um, a variety of different foods that they eat, and is their diet different at different stages of growth? Um, I'm asking because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they have different various types of uh, ingredients, various. Uh, ingredients that they they uh, consume throughout their life cycle even in every stage of uh, fish we have different uh, nutritional requirement so that's why when i said that uh, we have a lot of understudied species and these understudied species have different stage stage of uh, life life stages so all of them require different nutritional requirements so um, even our local species are also understudied. So we have been uh, focused too much on commercial commercial fish, but we haven't uh, we haven't tried to look at our local species. So I think um, that's my my future challenge. I think for me as a nutritionist, as a, as aquaculture nutritionist, I I would want to look into that. It's worth to be looked at. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's a call out there to young scientists. If you if you didn't know what needs working on, uh, it looks like uh, this is an uh, underexplored area and uh, a very important one for sustainable food supply in Malaysia. So uh, perhaps you want to, if those thinking of uh, furthering studies, maybe can contact Dr. Nohidaya. I'm sure she's got lots of project ideas for, yeah. for people or anyone wanting to collaborate, of course, as well. Uh, I'm sure she's uh, open for, for you to contact her. Uh, I think I'm going to yeah. bring it to a close now because we have, have gone a bit over time. Uh, unless there's any more burning questions, I'll give one, one last call for questions. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, please uh, do do answer the survey for us, and um, we will also look out for for further um, seminars in the future. And uh, again, thank you very much to both of our speakers, Dr. Nohita.